enhancement of members of the body of Christ. We call it a vaccine for the spiritual virus manufactured by Heaven's Company, headed by the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. We can all buy into the stock, but the, the cost of the stock is in a currency that the Fed cannot print and the market cannot exploit. Mm -hmm. And we're so happy to have you with us on this evening as we focus on community outreach, membership empowerment, and evangelism on a continuous basis. Before introducing our speaker for tonight, we want to pause for a word of prayer and we're asking Brother Colton Pace uh, to word our prayer at the opening tonight. Brother Pace. All right, there we go. Sorry about that. I was having trouble in meeting. Uh, thank you. Uh, will y'all please pray with me? Father God, I thank you for this opportunity for all of us to uh, come together and to listen to this uh, wonderful uh, series, these uh, lessons that we can um, use to grow closer to each other, to understand each other, and just grow as a kingdom. Uh, I pray for the lesson uh, tonight with uh, what Larry brings us, and I pray that uh, you can just help us to understand, to um, just be there to uh, listen to uh, the words and to uh, apply it to our lives and that uh, just through this we can um, be there to help grow closer to you and help others grow closer uh, to you as well. I thank you for your son. It's in Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much and we appreciate thank you. Uh, the encouragement of the prayer. Uh, let me present our speaker for this evening. Our speaker is Brother Larry Nunley. He's the preaching minister of the Airport Freeway Church of Christ in Euless, Texas. Minister Nunley was born in Alabama, raised in Tennessee, came to Texas by way of California, uh, where he spent some 14 years. It was there that he met and married his wife, as he called it, my beautiful wife, Patricia, and they now have four lovely daughters. Minister Nunley came to the Airport Freeway Church of Christ more than 10 years ago with the mission of seeking the lost. It is it always has been his goal to preach the word of God boldly. He says, we're ready to work in God's presence to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ to the airport freeway area and the world using Matthew 28 commission as its marching orders. The mission statement reads, it is our prayer that the whole gospel is preached, that we may bring salvation to the lost, encourage the weak, lift up the fallen, strengthen the saved, our hope and prayer and plea and aim is to faithfully produce and reproduce the church of the New Testament. For the next 30 minutes, uh, Brother Nana will be speaking to us on the subject, virtuous singleness. And Brother Nana, I want you to know that the Macalma Church of Christ is appreciative for you joining us in this format tonight. We look forward with anxiety, anxiousness for what you're gonna share with us. We're excited about you being here. And right now, Brother Nana, the podium is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Again, I bring you uh, greetings from uh, uh, the Airport Freeway Church across your sister congregation. And uh, just thanks to God for uh, uh, allowing you to ask me to speak. I feel so honored and privileged to everyone listening and to everyone who might get this later on. Uh, tonight, to get into it due to time, I'm, I'm not going to take the perspective so much i may deal with it but i'm not going to take the perspective so much of from single to married or trying to live your life so you can get married i i the, the title every time i hear the side of title virtuous singleness my mind says victorious singleness i had to correct myself several times i said no it's not as victorious singleness it's virtuous singleness but virtuous singleness is victorious singleness so uh, uh, victorious singleness and virtuous singleness, and if I interchange the word, forgive me throughout the night, but victorious singleness is being able to be single and not longing <laughs> or needing to be married. Uh, 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 it, it's not, it, it's, it's and, and I say this too, it's not a holding place for marriage, uh, just like, a deacon is not necessarily going to be an elder. 
uh, is a, a deacon is not an elder's place of, you know, the next step up. A deacon's place is a deacon's place. It is in and of itself. Uh, single is a place in and of itself. And I want to encourage singles to not feel like you're incomplete because you're not married or because you don't have a mate. I, I don't want you to feel that way. Uh, uh, I heard, uh, I was listening to Tony Evans, uh, some of you know the speaker, and he said something that's very uh, interesting. He says, don't mess up. Hold up, let me fix it. He says, don't miss freedom waiting on slavery. <laughs> uh, in other words, don't set in singleness waiting and waiting for fi some, to find someone to be married and missing out for the moment. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 6, uh, Paul is writing and the, in context, he's talking about finances. Uh, uh, when he says godliness with contentment is great gain. But I want to use this in, in terms of what our, for our message tonight, in 1 Timothy 6, he says godliness with contentment is great gain. And so if we apply this to the single lifestyle, to the married lifestyle, uh, godliness with contentment is great gain. That's simply saying I'm living according to God's will and I'm happy where I am. I'm not going to stay where I am. I'm happy where I am. I'm functional where I am. I'm productive where I am. I'm complete where I am. Why? It's because it's not a man. It is not a woman who completes me. It is God and God alone. Unfortunately, a lot of singles want to come into a marriage and say, hey, get this other side to complete me. I understand what they say when the Bible said the two shall become one. But it's not saying the two halves should become one. That's the wrong math. It's the two wholes should get together and work in unity as one. So when you come into a relationship, you're coming in complete, not half. Because in Christ Jesus, you lack nothing. So as the single lifestyle, virtuous singleness is empowered singleness. It is a life that is, I am happy, joyful, and I'm cool where I am if I stay where I am the rest of my life. Unfortunately, we have a lot of people, not only in the church, but in the world, who feel like that if I don't get married, then I, that means I'm going to be lonely. And we have these uh, uh, pessimistic, dreary in, uh, images in our minds of uh, coming home to a house by yourself. And I think it's one of the things that, uh, especially young ladies, and, and, I, and this is my experience, a lot of young ladies feel this way. Uh, they feel like, I don't want to be the old maid. I don't want to come home to nothing. Uh, uh, when we, I believe what God is doing with scripture, he is trying to turn our mind He's trying to turn our minds to uh, a, a different mentality. What does he say in Romans, the 12th chapter? He says, uh, present yourselves a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable act of worship. The first thing he's doing is telling you, get into God. Get into God. And then he says, be not conformed to this world. Don't try to think and move and live in the mentality of the world. He says, but be renewed by the transforming of your minds. Let your mind be transformed to God's thinking. And God has never said there's something wrong with being single. God has always said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we wanna look at being single from that perspective of, uh, of being uh, uh, able to see myself as not only as virtuous, but victorious. Uh, we're gonna look at a few things. I have uh, uh, five points that I'm gonna go through pretty quickly. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, being single, uh, the one that, uh, 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 thank you, sir. The, the one, being single 
is first of all, being able to be in control of your emotions. So many people, their emotions govern their viewpoint. Their emotions govern their actions. Uh, uh, they said they said there's three. They call them the three domains or the three houses of learning. It's the head, the heart, and the hands. Uh, you get the information that's uh, uh, cognitive. You uh, uh, receive information that's affective. That means it affects you, and then it goes to your hands to do. That's connotative. So you have the head, heart, hands. We see that played out in Acts, the second chapter on the day of Pentecost, the day the church was manifested to the world, when uh, Peter said in verse 36, he said, therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has uh, made this same Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. That was the information. The Bible said when they heard this, when they heard it, the head, heart, hands, when they heard this, they were pricked where? In their heart. And they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? Head, heart, hands. When people, when singles understand it's not the emotions that should govern you, but your head, heart, hands working together, the three houses of learning, the three domains of them. Get God's word in you. Let it affect you. And that will bring out work. Therefore, your emotions will be in check. So do not allow your emotions to govern who you are or what you do. We get an example on this and you could read this later on in Ephesians chapter four, verses 22 through 27. He talks about uh, the emotions. He says, for instance, uh, just for instance, he says, do not let uh, uh, anger. He said, be angry, sin not. Be angry, that's an emotion. God put those emotions there for a reason. But sin not, in other words, control your emotions. You remember when God came to Cain in the garden after, uh, uh, after uh, excuse me, after they were kicked out of the garden, God came to Cain and when they offered the sacrifice, God told Cain, he said, Cain, sin crouches at your door and its desire is to have you, but you must master it. You are in control. God has put us into control. So don't let loneliness, fear, bitterness, anger, and stuff dictate to you. It's so many people who have tried to pick a mate based from those emotions. And I tell everybody, doing that is just like going shopping when you're hungry. You will put anything in your basket and bring it home. So uh, uh, don't let emotions dictate to you. Y'all also could lead or to read, can read 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. The second point is keeping yourself in a relationship with God. Purpose seeking, uh, uh, seeking your gift. One thing uh, uh, we can do as uh, victorious singles is, uh, I'm married, but I mean victorious single, meaning us, meaning the family, humans, uh, uh, the Christians rather, uh, is keeping our purpose. There's a lot of single people who are just uh, walking around here, you know, droopy and stuff and just looking and they look desperate. Why? Because they don't have purpose. When you find purpose, when you find purpose, then that keeps you busy. That keeps you in the work. Uh, your purpose, Ephesians 2.10, the Bible says, God has created us in Christ Jesus to do good works, which were given to us before the worlds were framed. I tell people, in other words, God made a job, a work, and then he made you to do this work. A Phillips head screwdriver is designed to, fill up in, to fit into a Phillips head screw. And, now, and that's the purpose. It's designed its purpose. A hammer is designed to pound. A saw is designed to cut. You are designed in Christ Jesus, and there's purpose. When you get involved in your purpose, oh my goodness, you open up. You, you, you begin to see the world differently, and you don't walk around here looking for someone to complete you. 
because you are already completed. And not only are you already completed because we are complete in Christ Jesus, but you are more than a conqueror. When you come home by yourself, you don't come home uh, to an empty house. You come home to a sanctuary. You come home to a temple. You come home to the synagogue. You come home to church. Because this place is filled with praise from God. Thank God I'm single. And I don't mind getting married, but thank God I'm single. I know when I walk out the house where everything is. If something broke, I don't have to get upset. Why? Because it's mine. <laughs> Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. You know, it's people. There was a song or a saying that says, I could do bad all by myself. And, and I just remember uh, uh, and, uh, some people say, oh, he's, I, I want to get somebody cause so he can be my everything or she can be my everything. I remember in a movie, Cicely Tyson was in the movie and she was someone's grandmother or mother rather, one of those. And, and her daughter came in to visit her. Some of y'all may, may know the movie I'm talking about. Her daughter came in to visit her and she said, her daughter was going through a divorce and her daughter's character said to Cicely Tyson's character, she said, but he's my everything. And Cicely Tyson's character got upset. She says, no, he's not your everything. Only God is your everything. And every single person need to understand that. Every married person need to understand that. God is your everything. And see, and see when you try to put people in places where they shouldn't be, that's called abuse. <laughs> that's abusing them. You understand? So don't make finding somebody the point of your life. Make understanding the power of who God is, is in you the point of your life. In your work, put your gifts together because they will take you on a journey. Oh my goodness, they will take you somewhere that you've never been, that another mate can't take you. And the church said, amen. God doesn't understand that God has designed us. 1 Peter 4, verses 10 through 11. God has designed us. He says when God, God has put it in us. God has put it in us to do this. And these are our gifts. I suggest to any single person, if you are single and you're looking for a mate, find out your spiritual giftedness first. There you go. <laughs> they thank you. Find out your spiritual giftedness first. You know, come when, when, when God in the garden, when God brought Eve to Adam, both of them were complete. They weren't two halves. They were two whole complete people to work together in unity as one. In unity as one. So, Work in your gift. You could check that out. Uh, uh, it's that, that story in Genesis chapter 2, verses uh, 15 through 25. Man, uh, that's a beautiful message. Check that out. Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 through 25. So the first thing is being in control of your emotions. Don't let your emotions dictate to you how you're going to function or even feel. Next is... Seeking your gifts, seeking your gifts because God has put them in you to give you your work, your function. The third is seeking your gift. Uh, excuse me, let me say this. Seek, seeking your gift, I want to say this. This is still under your gifts. Seeking your gift is not idle busyness. <laughs> You understand? It's not just getting busy to keep your mind off of your real trouble. That's not it. That's not what seeking your gift is about. It's not hiding from your fear or of being lonely. That's not what it is. Remember, the, the Bible says in first and uh, second Timothy chapter, uh, uh, excuse me, the Bible says in second Timothy chapter one, he says, in, starting in verse seven, God has not given us the spirit of fear but of power, love, and a sound mind. So you're not, you know, get, seeking your gifts. Uh, I know a lot of people get in church work, get in ministry, get in this, get in this, get in this, get in this, get in, work extra hours. Do, 
Why? Because they're afraid to come home to an empty home. God, is, that's not what God said. That's not God's answer. God's answer is seeking you. And see, God's answer is seeking him and being able to look at your empty home and see it filled with God. And you say, well, brother, none of this, this bunch of words and stuff easy to say. Well, the best way the Bible says, you got to work in faith. You know, it, I know it's just, it may sound like empty words. It may sound like just words, but believe me, baby, it's not. This stuff is real. This is real. God is real. His faith is real. And once you put your, his words in your life, you will see the benefits. That's why he's talking about in Romans, the 12th chapter. He says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may be able to prove that acceptable and perfect will of God. That's what God is looking for. And when you let God have you, oh my goodness, you, you have the greatest return of all in your investment. So I, I don't want to move on, but keep those things. Uh, uh, let your, don't let your emotions control you. Keep uh, 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 your purpose with God. Let God build in you. Uh, let God uh, reveal to you the, the uh, uh, gift that he's put in you, and then you manifest that to the world. Uh, and, and that's not idle working. That is fulfillment of God's work in you. Next is, uh, I have here, is marriage is not singleness, nor is singleness marriage. I said this kind of earlier. They are two different stages of life to be used by God. One is not a waiting place for the other. And I want to encourage you not to look at it from that perspective. It's not a waiting place for, okay, I'm going to get here and I'm going to get myself ready to be married. No, I'm getting myself ready for service. And when you do that, God will send you out. You know what the Bible says in Matthew 19, what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Well, what do you think? How are you going to put you together? God has a way to get you to where you need to be. And when you're seeking your gifts first, he will send you in the right place to the right people with the right attitude. Get in your spirit. Understand if you are single and you are lonely and stuff, there are ways and things to do according to God's word with the spirit of God. There's ways to handle this. You know, I tell people, you know, stop, stop watching scary movies if you can't come in the room by yourself. <laughs> They're practical things to do. Stop looking at all these movies that make you all oh, long to be, oh, I want to be, oh, I got to have somebody. Stop putting yourself in that position. You, you, you understand what I'm saying? These are practical ways to look at it, but the work of God. When, when God gets you busy, he's not getting you busy to avoid loneliness or singleness. He's getting you busy to confront it and to make the best of it and to be powerful in it because loneliness is not from God. He will destroy that and put in you a fulfillment. That song that's a long time ago, God is saying, I want to get next to you. He want to get close. Maybe he wants to get close. And, and I, I read this poem, and, and in the poem it said simply, God wants you to date him before you date someone else. Very interesting. God wants a relationship. And if you spend your time trying to find somebody or something, then I, I encourage you, I know what you mean, but I encourage you to seek out God and to realize how victorious you are, how victorious you are. Amen, Rolls Royce. How victorious you are as a human being. And, 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 and then sometimes we need to stay away from these labels. I'm single. You know, I, no, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. I'm black. No, I'm a human. You know, I'm a man. No, I'm a human. You know, sometimes these labels injure us because they have stigmas connected to them. I am a child of God. 
Are you conservative or Republican? I'm a child of God. <laughs> oh, man. Y'all, well, I think we're about ready through soon. I think we're through soon. I want to cover one more thing if I have time. Take some time, brother. Okay. Uh, 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 I want to cover this this last part, which is seen to be a real issue, which is sex. Uh, unfortunately, most people, not only Christians, but most people, uh, especially in this country, we learn sex and intimacy not through the church. We are so afraid to talk about it. And we only talk about it on shallow surfaces. And we give what we call, what I call church answers. And, 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 and we don't talk about it because we're afraid if I say something a little different than what the masses think, then I'm going to get ostracized. And I know everybody doesn't think the same way. Uh, in John 8, 32, the Bible says you shall know the truth and it will set you free. I encourage, especially singles, uh, uh, and, and married. Uh, again, not trying to label everything, but I encourage people to talk about these things, sex and intimacy from the perspective of God. Uh, when you're single, God has put in you a drive that is good. The Bible says in Genesis 1, uh, starting around verse 26 and on down, where God says, uh, and God said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. And then he goes on down, he gets to verse 27 or 28, and he says, uh, uh, and God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And then he gets down to verse 31 of Genesis chapter one. He says, and God saw all that he made and it was very good. The point that I'm saying is God put sex drive in us. We didn't create it. Man didn't create it. We messed it up. We distorted it. We abused it. But God put the sex drive in us. That's a good thing. I remember I didn't get married till I was 35 years old. I was single, never had never, never, no kids, not married. I didn't get married till I was 35. And I was and still am. I, I love sex. <laughs> love it. But I had to come and talk to some of my brother in church. And I said, man, what do you do? I'm single and I don't want to disappoint God and blah, blah. And they were telling me, oh, pray it away. What? I, I think this needs to be talked about. And I encourage group to talk about this. Uh, a lot of singles, and I say singles, uh, 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 some people who have never been married, some people are married, divorced, some people are single parents. Some people who married and their parent and their spouse died, and 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 the thing is that we we, we got to talk about it because you may sit here and say amen amen all day long, but your loins are still warm. Why? That's a good thing. God made that in you. Don't be as shy of that. Don't be uh, embarrassed of that. God made you that way. So. That is the reality that we have to face. But again, when you allow God to have you and you're seeking for your gifts and you're not ran by your emotions, then sex begins to easy, it be easier put in its proper place. I don't have much time to go through that. Uh, I, I hope you ask questions about it and stuff so we can cover it some more. But I want y'all to know, y'all, being single is powerful. I, I feel so good now married with four daughters, but I wasn't as a single longing and go, oh, I got to find me somebody. I, I was happy and fun and serving God. So if you're that way, I bless God on you to do that and live that way and be confident and, com uh, and comfortable in serving God as a person without a family, without a mate, but somebody who has God and never alone. Thank you, that's it. I was listening, so I forgot to unmute myself. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much.
Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you for the message. I know that all of us have enjoyed what you've had to say. And I'm sure that there's probably somebody who have some questions for you. Uh, we're going to transition now. Uh, Maggie, uh, we're going to ask you if you got any questions. Let's, let's, uh, let's uh, come on with it. Yeah, you rushing me? <laughs> oh, I'm okay. not rushing you. I'm just... <laughs> I'm just giving you a hard time. Okay, yes, we do have questions, Brother Larry. Mm -hmm. So the first question is, what can members slash leadership do to support single members? Oh, I, I, that's a great question. Uh, I, I think, uh, one, stop treating, uh, if they're doing this, I'm not saying they're doing this, but don't make singles something that's a side order. Uh, really uh, and, uh, build them up because singles, sometimes are the greatest worker in the church. Why? Because they have energy, they have time, <laughs> you know, and, and, and we, and, and a lot of them want to do something. So direct our uh, prayers to God and ask God to, uh, uh, and I'm talking about leadership and all of us, ask God to uh, give us wisdom on how to uh, deal with our singles, uh, addressing them not only as singles, but addressing them as just humans and also mixing the, the, the uh, diversity of single and married. You know, a lot of times the, I think they were saying the percentage like over half the churches are single mm. or great majority of the church is single. So uh, use them and, and not use them like they're just a side order, but make them feel like, hey, this church cares for me. Every sermon doesn't and I and I'm I'm guilty of this. I have preached a lot of sermons and I talked about uh, marriage and family, marriage and family. And somebody came up to me and said, "Well, what about us?" And I realized, wow, you know, I, I neglected that because uh, uh, they're part of the family too. So I encourage them to uh, pray about it first of all, and then uh, use these singles to really push energy and ideas and use their imaginations and ideas and creativity to reach out and help the youth to be mentors, uh, to be the foot and the, the feet in the hands of, of a ministry. Okay, the next question is, mm -hmm. how do we develop a singles ministry that can thrive and stay consistent? That's a uh, good question. Very good question. It, that's a, more of, of technique and, 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 and philosophies of how you work stuff. Because a, a singles group can be good just in its lessons and things, but there's way strategies. That's what's the word I was looking for. Strategies of, first of all, with a singles group, I think getting your list of singles and getting them committed and getting them committed and don't just do the same thing all the time. Yeah, uh, footwork, it's just like in college. Those who went to college know you have a, a technical class that you go to class and then you have something that's connected to it called lab. The lab is the hands-on, it's the, it's the touching of it. So uh, uh, getting our singles group, first of all, get a core group that is going to be, uh, 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 dedicated and 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 get that i would say this this is strategy get that organized how is going how you're going to do it and then uh uh in your lessons be real singles want to be real uh, these group these groups they want to be real they don't like shallow conversation they can get that anywhere on the uh, 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 just on the corner when they come to church they want real answers and they want real discussion you know, and, 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 and always keep it with God's word, not your emotions or what I feel or what society said or what this, but always keep God's word in, but get deep. They love deep. <laughs> I, I, when I was a single, I love deep discussions on that respectfully, but deep discussions on different topics, not always sexual or intimacy, but different things we could talk about, even in doctrine. Even in church stuff, something that's, you know, just passed on that, that we want to, uh, you know, uh, as the Bible says in 1 John 4, 1, try the spirits to see whether they be of God, you know, the, the things like that. So I think getting a core group 
getting them dedicated and build out from there. Okay, and then I I caught the first two points, but I couldn't remember what the third one was. Don't allow your emotions to control you. Find your purpose in life. What was the third uh, one? Before you uh, said- find your purpose in life. The third one was, look, you got me, let me go back to my notes. The third one was, uh, hold up, was right here. Oh, it was of the uh, uh, the sexual, doing oh, the sex, okay. talk about the sex. Okay. The, okay. Yeah, sex and intimacy. Okay. Okay, so the next question is, how do you get more people to come to singles conferences? Usually way more women attend than men. That's been a problem for years. Uh, men, <laughs> you got to go get men. Women will come. <laughs> you know, they, they'll just come because it's, uh, uh, I guess, have a two drink minimum. I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Which after Christ, we don't drink. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I think men, seriously, to go get men, uh, you have to go get them. Uh, it, it, get men who are there and put them on going getting men and making a effort. Hey, I know two guys. I'm going to really be on them. We're going to try to get uh, uh, this group, this conference is like 50 people there. Let's just use an example. And normally 35 are women. Well, we're going to try to get 15 more men. So seven of our men that are there, we're going to go and make a goal to get two. So there, again, that strategy, that strategy, uh, the message and stuff, that scripture, uh, you use scripture and all that stuff and the teaching, but the strategy of getting people to the conference, you have to come up with different strategies and things. And I think that's one good thing is getting men to go get men. Mm. Okay. Which I guess, do you feel like men feel a little bit differently about marriage than women? Is that maybe one reason why it's more women at conferences too? Yeah, I, I I agree. Yes, I think they do. But I think that's a lot of it. It's faulty because they feel that way. We have been taught so much about marriage from old perspectives and different perspectives. You know, society changes and it changes the mindset of certain things. But if we just keep the same thought, then it, it kind of like that woman. You heard the story about the, the woman who was cooking a ham. She put it in, um, before she put it in the oven, she cut the end of it off, put it in the pan and put it in the uh, oven. Her husband saw her, he said, why did you cut the, off, the end of the ham off? She said, I don't know, I did it because my mother did. Called her mother, her mother said, I did it because my mother did it. Called her mother, her mother said, I did it because the ham was always too big for the pan. So when we realize society and things have changed, we need to address our method, not the message, the method of teaching that will alter a lot of times our thinking. So I think men do see marriage differently. We see sex differently. We see intimacy different. We see it differently, again, because a lot of faulty teaching, but also because our basis, we're different. We're men, you're women. That's just a fact. We see it differently. And it's not only cultural. I think all times, sometimes it's just DNA. That's another sermon. (laughs) Amen. (laughs) Okay, so the next question is, how can one date and speak on sex and the relationship with God to someone who isn't a Christian but believes that that they are? How can someone date and speak on sex to someone who thinks they're a Christian but they're not? And the relationship with God to someone who isn't a Christian but believes that they are? Oh. Oh, I think, I mean, again, that's a, that's a difficult task. It depends on the individual and the circumstances. But just in the general context, I believe, again, a lot of prayer. Start everything with prayer. Start everything with prayer. Everything. The mm-hmm. smallest to the greatest. Start it with prayer. Always. Mm-hmm. And uh, then when you come across this situation, again, get into your giftedness of the purpose uh, uh, make your purpose to be a light for this person. 
And then you can be Jane, John 8, 32, a light for them. Why? Because you know the truth and you're set free. When you are free, you're not afraid to talk about stuff. If you're trapped because you've been taught a whole bunch of stuff and it's wrong and this, and you come out and you kind of talk and you kind of fidgety. But when you when your heart is open to God, then you can sit and talk to somebody because you're going to treat them the way God said. In Ephesians 4, 15, you're going to speak the truth in love. So don't try to battle someone who thinks they're a Christian and you don't believe they are, you think something wrong. Don't battle them. Just do as Jesus did. Uh, oftentimes you see the, in the Bible when Jesus is answering questions or dealing with somebody, he asked questions. Mm. He asked questions. Instead of making statements, he asked questions. So I think, yes, approach people from that perspective, asking questions. Uh, oh, well, why do you do this? What do you think about relationship? Uh, or maybe later on into relationship, how do you think we're doing? What have, what do you think? Uh, when I first married, uh, when I first married, when I first uh, went out with my wife, uh, it was after a midnight watch service at church. And we went over her father's house. Then we came back to her house like three o'clock in the morning. We're talking and we're just talking. And she begins to tell me about how she was raised and stuff like, and right then I knew, okay, I, I can, I can be with her. It's spending time with this person not trying to, to prove them wrong, not bringing up, just spend time with them and let them see Jesus in you. And then you can start teaching them Jesus. But people don't care how much you uh, uh, know until they know how much you care. Okay, next question. He said he had another point, but skipped to six. What was the other point he said he had five at first? I know. I, I, I apologize. I, when I looked down, I had him. I was just looking at him. I, I, I'm, a, I'm not a points preacher. And when I put this down, I had to go, oh, wait, wait, wait. Is that a point? And I apologize for that. That's me. I'm not a three point, you know, introduction, three point and ending. I'm not that kind of preacher. So when I have to lay stuff out like that, I got a, it was a stuttering for me. So I messed up. I apologize for that. But the points that I was trying to make and stick with was being in control of your emotions, keeping yourself in a relationship with God. And that was dealing with the same as purpose and seeking your gifts. That was number two. And the last one was uh, 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 sex and dealing with that. And in, in, in point number two, I also talked about uh, uh, seeking your gifts is not being uh, uh, idle busyness. It's not covering up loneliness. I kind of talked about that under gifts. So my three points were uh, emotions, keeping yourself uh, uh, with the gifts, and the sexual uh, aspect of relationship. Okay, hopefully that answered their question. I hope so, so the next question is, what are some of the teachings the church typically lacks when it comes to sexual desire? Do you think additional teaching would help quell the pervasiveness of fornication? <laughs> oh my goodness, I think it would help because what does teaching do? The teaching of the word change hearts. So yes, teaching head, heart, hands, information, effectiveness, connotation, doing. Uh, 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 yes, I do. What I think it is lacking is a lot. And, and this is no offense to anyone because when I say this, I kind of say this stuttering because it is a touchy subject. It's not something you can cover in one answer. Uh, but I will say this. What is the church lacking? I believe a lot. One, again, our perspective of sex is from way back and society has changed. Uh, I'll give you an example. I had a friend of mine, she's passed on. She's, uh, uh, she was in her seventies. And she told me that when she was a kid, if she said the word pregnant, she would get smacked. Uh, some of you 
may know this, that Kellogg's cornflakes, they were designed by Dr. Kellogg to take away sexual desire or something like it. But, uh, but, but that's the purpose of it. It was something to, because sex was evil. Yeah. It was bad for, I mean, a majority of the idea of it. So what happened when a single person, if he's been flooded with that all his life and he or she wants to please God, and then they sat here and a beautiful girl or a guy walked past in front of him and they look, they automatically have this guilty conscience. Why? Because of what they were taught. And God made that man look good to that woman. And God made that woman to look good to that man. But when he looks at her and somebody tells her, I saw you looking at him or her, then we got this guilty play that we just, we bombard each other with. Then we grow up in this mentality and then we get married and think all of a sudden everything just going to fall flop and fall into place and it doesn't it's three things that divorces generally have problem with is communicating finances and sexual intimacy why because we haven't learned about either one of these things we think automatically it's just supposed to fall in there and it happened y'all can see this dear to my heart <laughs> we think it's just supposed to happen and it doesn't it needs to be taught, but no one wants to talk about it because we're afraid. We're uncomfortable with it. I don't want to talk about sex. I'll tell y'all something. I hope everybody on here has grown, but I know Christians masturbate. I know Christians look at porn. I know Christians are out there having sex. I know they're doing it. And they come to church and amen, everything said. But why are they doing it? Not because they're bad and mean and sneaky. It's because they don't know, but their human nature, which God put in them, is calling. But they're afraid to talk to somebody about it because if I say the wrong thing, I'll probably get ostracized or talked about or put on the spot. Well, then I, that must be what you're doing. Oh, my goodness. We kill each other because it's sex. I want everybody to say it. It's sex, sex, sex. It's beautiful. God made it, but he made it with him in mind, not just you. Y'all gonna get me preaching another sermon. <laughs> <laughs> okay, hold off on the preaching. We have several more questions. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you said earlier that when addressing sex and telling someone to pray isn't quite enough. Can you elaborate on how to be free to express that you're sexually active but want to date without sex? Oh my God, go on. Now we get into the real questions. <laughs> oh, wait, wait, wait. And then there's and then there's a question within another question in that too. Uh -huh. Can one be intimate without having sex? I know several who are single, but having sex and married couples seem to be out of touch with helping. Yes, you can. Intimacy and sex are not necessarily this goes on at the same time. They involve together, but they're not necessarily happening. If you're talking about that physical intimacy, yes, anytime you have sex, the Bible says you become one. That's physical intimacy. You can't change that. That's just the biological makeup. God said that the two, when they have sex, they become one. If it's a, you and your wife or you and a, a, a prostitute, y'all become one. That's what God said. But sex is deeper than physical intimacy. Physical intimacy is the manifestation of emotional intimacy. Y'all see? Your biggest sex organ is not in your pants. It's in between your ears. And that's where the intimacy starts. So uh, how do you, what, what was that question? The first part of that question? Um, how to, can you elaborate on how to be free to express oh. that you're sexually active but want to date without sex? Go, 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 uh, go again but to scriptures such as John 8, 32, knowing the truth and set you free. Being honest. Stop saying, well, I don't think about that when you know you do. I don't do that when you know you do. I don't feel that way when you know you do. You know what I'm saying? Uh, uh, so uh, uh, 
how do we deal with that? Is being honest with self, being able to communicate, talk to them, and it may take bits at a time. Sometimes you can overload. I am, I overload. <laughs> I overload. And sometimes you can overload. Gingerly put it in at steps, and it may take a while. Don't try to have this conversation all at once all the time. You know, sometimes share it with them and let them know, yes, I love sexual intimacy, but I don't want to have sex. Why? And explain to them why. Because I want to please God first. You're not my number one. God is. I hope I answered that. Okay. So do you believe that all should be married? How can one know that singleness is for them? Oh, uh, again, go back to Genesis chapter two, and I'm, I'm using from the perspective of a man, but this could fit anybody, but I'm using it because it comes from the perspective of a man. And go to Genesis chapter two, start at verse 15. The Bible says, God put Adam in the garden of Eden. And Eden is a word, and I'm not, believe me, I don't know all this stuff. I just heard it, was taught it. Eden is a word that means spot on the earth with an open door to God a delightful place. God put Adam in his presence. And I heard Dr. Miles Monroe, who passed on, he, he said this. Uh, he said, God put Adam first in his presence. And then he told Adam to work. And it means to become, put, do what I put you here to do. And then he says to care for. And then after that, he gave him said, do not eat of the tree. So he put him in his presence, told him to become, told him to care for, and gave him responsibility. Don't eat of the tree. And then he said after that, then God said, it is not good for man to be alone. Mm. Put yourself in the right place. That's why I'm saying don't come to try to get married as a half. Come as a whole. When you know, you will know that it's okay to be single when you are okay and you are and you are uh, uh, thriving by yourself, hmm. and it's okay to get married also at that time. <laughs> okay, give some tools or other resources to finding our purpose and controlling our emotions because we told we are because we told what to do but not always given the tools to do so. Mm, mm, amen. 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 Uh, I, I, I don't have any books on the top of my head to think of except the Bible. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and, and uh, you know, the Bible talks about in Ephesians, he says, be angry and sin not. Uh, uh, and don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Don't give place to Satan. The Bible says in uh, uh, first Timothy and uh, first Peter chapter two, he says, uh, in, verse, in the verses of war, he says, verses before that in chapter one, he said, you have been born again of corruptible, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible. Realize that you're born again. You are a new creation. And he says, Be, uh, 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 you were born by the living word of God, which lives and abides forever. Then he says, therefore, chapter two, verse one, lay aside all filthiness and all this stuff. In other words, he's saying lay it aside, which tells me I have the power through God to lay it aside. Mm -hmm. So I can control my emotions, I understand that, that I can do it. And that if I put my will to God's will, it will be done. Mm -hmm. And uh, 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 that's just from that. But practical things are, again, honesty is the best policy with yourself. If I'm lonely, okay, I'm lonely. T tell yourself, okay, I'm lonely. I am, I'm lonely. I wish I had this, okay, now, I'm honest with that. Now, what's the best way to deal with this loneliness? And go back to God. And, and those are just small answers. There are so many other answers. Uh, the way God's word and prayer, pray, pray, pray. Not just pray like, oh, I say the prayer, but work your prayer. I heard somebody say, pray as if everything depends on God and work as if everything depends on you. Put your prayer to work and discover your gifts. Seek your gifts. Seek them. Matthew 6, ask and it shall be given. Seek and you shall find. Knock and shall be opened up to you. Okay, so the next question is, what are some suggestions we can share with our single friends to help them see a relationship is not going anywhere? 
Oh, uh, do you mean the relationship with a friend that their relationship is not going anywhere? I'm, that you're I'm, trying to tell my buddy, hey, my man, hey, you and this girl is not working, that kind of thing? Right, that's what I think, yes. Oh, okay. Oh, uh, the best way, again, and I know I keep saying this, and, and I mean more than this, but the Bible says in James, the effectual fervent prayers of the righteous avails much. Pray before you interject with them. Pray with them, because this is these are sensitive subjects. If you just go off of, from your point of view and your emotions, you may wreck, wreck theirs. So pray, 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 pray. And then talk to them and don't tell them stuff so much. Ask questions. How are you feeling? Why do you feel this way? Are you being honest when you say this? What is she doing or what is he doing? Is it just about feelings? Are they making you grow closer to God or farther away from God? Do you even think about God with them? Have you spoken to them about God? Ask questions and let them lead themselves to the answer still you draw them there. Because if you take them there, you could take a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. <laughs> okay, next question is, how do we encourage young men of color to marry first before getting children? Mm. Uh, again, we covered... A, Young men of color that, you know, in the African-American community in this country is said that 70% upwards to 70% of uh, kids are born to fatherless homes. Mm. And, uh, and Newsweek years ago, Newsweek said 92% of global problems are fatherless homes. So it's not just color. These are men in general. How do we, it's the same answer for color and no matter who the color they are, it's the same answer. Uh, get people to understand there's a relationship with God. You know, it's not just, oh, God is up here. I, if I understand that I can hurt God, I don't mean hurt God, I mean like injure him. I mean hurt God meaning like you hurt him because, you know, oh my goodness, oh, he hurt me. You can hurt God. You can make God happy. You can hurt him. Understand the true relationship. So how do we uh, get men to know that is try to establish or introduce, if they don't have, a relationship with God, not just church. I tell people, I invite people to church to get them to know God, but I first want to introduce them to God, and then I invite them to church. So uh, uh, let's get people to understand God is real. And the first thing is to do is to be real with God yourself. Let people see you functioning as a Christian and then talk to them and let them know. And there's so much evidence that it's not good to have a child out of wedlock. It's not good to have sex before marriage. It may be fun for that moment, but it always come back and bite you. Mm. Okay, uh, next question. On TV, it is very common to see singles living together or having sex with their partners with no shame. Do you have any idea how much influence this might have on Christian singles? I think a lot. I think a lot, especially a Christian who is not dedicating himself to God's word. Uh, uh, my father used to say, a man who won't stand for something will fall for anything. Uh, you have people who... Uh, uh, Christians who are not in God's word. And so they begin to have a, philo a philosophical idea and still a theological idea. Theological meaning God's word, philosophical meaning your feelings and emotions. So uh, getting into God's word, uh, and I'm not just talking about open the Bible and read it, I'll read it from Genesis to Revelation. I'm talking about getting into God's word. Jesus said in Matthew 7, the man who hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house upon the stone or the rock. When the rains come, the winds blow and beat against the house. When you get very horny, when that girl is rubbing up on you inside your house, when that boy is playing with himself in front of you, when y'all doing, doing all this, and this is what happens in sex, I hope I don't offend anybody, but when all that stuff get real, the stuff is going to help you is the word of God. You remember when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness? Jesus was hungry. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights. Some people haven't had sex and, and their bodies going, eat, feed me, Elmo. <laughs> feed me. 
What did Jesus say? It is written. And you know Jesus was, Jesus was hungry. You know he was hungry. But how did he battle say With the word. So get back into the word. Okay, last question. Um, do you think that a, that a minister or leaders who were married at very young ages, for example, early 20s, can relate to relationship problems that singles encounter or even place a high value on single Christians? Yeah, yeah I think they can. I mean, Paul, well, we understand, was not married, and Paul talked about marriage, inspired of God. I think a single person can, I mean, a preacher who was married early can uh, I think he does have to put himself, like the Bible said in, in Galatians, he says, when somebody is overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore such a one, considering yourself. You know, this person has to put himself in their shoes. Uh, it's easy for somebody who was married, and that's what happened to me. When I was coming to these people in, in my 30s and late 20s and mid 20s, telling them, Man, I just I want to have sex and I don't know what to do. And I, and then they'll tell me, oh, just pray it away. That's like, oh, you wasn't talking to me. Mm. Oh, you, you're not talking to me. You, you, you're just talking. And, 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 and you, you are not really paying attention to me. That minister needs to pay attention and understand I need to talk to them from a place to where they can understand, where they can see where I'm coming from. So yeah, I think he can. The question is, you know, that there's ways to do it. Right. Okay, that's all the questions I have. Thank you, Brother Larry. Thank you so much. God bless you guys. Thank you for monitoring this stuff. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. God bless you all. We have really appreciate your message and your response to our questions. Uh, thank, thank you for you. being here. Thank you for the candor of your presentation and, and for touching us in a real uh, live setting. It's been blessing to us and we appreciate you very much. Um, Thank you. Before departure, let me uh, let you know what's coming up next week. Uh, we'll be looking next week, uh, Robin Mitchell will be our speaker next week and he'll be talking about money management. And then following week, Dr. Thomas Jackson will be our speaker. He'll be talking about mental health. Following that, uh, James Gentry will be our speaker. He'll be talking about marriage, choked by the yoke, or uh, loose by the love. And that will be on the 25th of May. That brings us to the end of the month of May. Look forward to having you back with us uh, in next week's session if you can possibly be with us at that time. Uh, I think that's pretty much uh, all that we have uh, on the agenda for today. Let's see. We're getting ready for our closing prayer. And uh, I was I had the name of the person who was going to do our prayer uh, tonight, uh, Brother Anthony. I can't Brother, Ant Brother Anthony, I'm going to just say, <laughs> I'm just going to say Brother Anthony. Um, uh, me, Brother Harris, before, uh, look, I I'm really usurping my authority tonight, but uh, we have one person <laughs> requesting that you do your, where you ask the speaker to say anything that they did not get to say in their presentation. We have someone requesting mm. that you do that. Uh, well, okay. Uh, Brother Nala, you still with us? Yes, sir. Uh, is there something that you wanted to say that you didn't get a chance to say? It, yes, it had to do a lot with sexual intimacy. It has to do a lot with uh, um, relationships. It had to do a lot with the church and how we need to go forward in dealing with uh, uh, singles life confrontations. And I, I don't have enough time to really go over it because this is near and dear to my heart. Uh, it was a blessing that God allowed me to speak on this. But I would say this for the church, and it's going to start with small groups, intimate one-on-one -on -one talks or groups of young uh, people. I say young people, people. 
start discussing about intimacy. And it's not always sexual intimacy, but intimacy in general. Start talking about that with one another and start enjoying, excuse me, start encouraging each other to be honest with one another and be okay with opening up. You know, be okay with letting some information out. If you struggle with pornography, be able to talk about it. And I know that's hard. If you struggle with uh, 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 your, your relationship with your spouse, be able to talk about it. Learn how to talk in these small groups because then we set a culture in the church. And then they said, they said the studies show that when a culture begins to talk more openly about sex, they said that sexual predators can't persuade young people as much to do what they do because the young people are now educated more openly and they're able to say, no, you can't do that to me. You're not gonna scare me and threaten me. So yes, make the communications open and start talking about this because sex is who we are. I'm gonna be through, but y'all, do you realize there's no one on the face of this earth that's over 130 years old that we know? No one. So that means in the last 130 years, we, God has allowed us to put on this earth 7.5 billion people in just 130 years. Somebody's having sex. So let's stop acting like, oh, we just be crying and go, ah, la, 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 la. It'll go away. It won't go away. We have to talk about it and deal with it. So, brother, not only would you uh, consider coming back at a future date and, and uh, dealing with this how to talk and, and uh, helping us with some lingo. Preacher, I would love to do that. And I want to say not that I'm an authority on it. I am not. But I am somebody who is curious who studies, who prays, who seeks God. Yes, I would love to do that. Thank you, sir. Thank you so Thank much. You. So now we will uh, we will turn to Brother Anthony Aconquo uh, to lead us in our final prayer. Let us bow. Almighty Father, we once again, humbly come before your throne of grace and mercy. Father, first and foremost, we want to just say thank you for everything, Father. Father, we consistently prove ourselves unworthy, but still you see fit to preserve us day after day and give us everything that we need and even more than that, Heavenly Father. Father, we come to you specifically right now, uh, thanking you for giving us all this opportunity to have this fellowship with one another, to learn your word. Heavenly Father, to, to learn alongside one another, Heavenly Father. Father, we pray that you please continue to bless these meetings, bless these fellowship opportunities, Heavenly Father. Continue to give us these opportunities to have this sort of fellowship with one another, Heavenly Father, to have these sorts of conversations. Help us to have these conversations with one another and to have these conversations with those next to us and everybody around us, Heavenly Father, so that we can all grow within you, Father. Father, I want to pray that you uh, please continue to watch over us, Father. Bless our everyday lives, Heavenly Father. There's a lot of circumstances that are going on in our lives, a lot of issues, some things that go said and some things that we remain silent on, Father, but we know regardless, mm -hmm. you see everything. Father, we mm -hmm. pray that you please place your hand in all circumstances, all of these situations. Guide them as you see fit, Heavenly Father, to your glory. Father, please forgive us of any of our trespasses, Heavenly Father. Please bless all of us as your servants to be the servants to you that you want us to be, Heavenly Father, to be able uh, to touch others, Heavenly Father, and show them you and your son, Father. There's so much that we can ask, Heavenly Father, uh, but we know that you know all things, Heavenly Father. Look in our lives, see what we need, Heavenly Father, and bless us with those. Help us to continue to grow in you and to grow alongside one another. Please, again, bless us to have this sort of fellowship with one another once again, Father. Help our two congregations to become closer to one another, Heavenly Father. We pray this prayer in your mighty son, Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So can I say something real quick? Uh, May I say something real quick? Yes, sir. That is Anthony uh, Aconco. He's one of our uh, uh, members. He and his beautiful wife. Uh, he teaches our young adults. And the uh, 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 the gentleman who prayed the first Colton pace, 
He's our youth minister. Just wanted to let you know that, guys. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you again. Megan? Okay. Hold on just a second, y'all. Okay, so thank you to Brother Nunley for his message on virtuous singleness, and thank you to everyone that joined us tonight. So we did have some technical difficulties with our live stream, so a recording will be made available within the next 24 hours. So once it is available, please make sure that you share it on Facebook so that others can hear the message. And once again, please, please, please continue to invite your family, friends, and foes to our All Souls Matter campaign that's going to be every Tuesday at 630. So thank you again brother nunley and you all have thank a great you. night and we'll see you all next week thank you for doing all that what you do thank you <laughs> okay you're welcome <laughs> good night <laughs>